great to see you this morning. And I do want to start here with the market sell-off we've seen. And the fact that we have seen this pullback, sizable pullback in all the major averages really since the start of the year. How is this shaping the way you are approaching investing in 2022? And does it change your thesis, especially coming off of rather large gains for the S&P, for example, in 2021? Yeah, so Morgan, uh, first of all, good morning. Um, that's a great question and very timely. So first of all, I would start with the context um, that it is not wholly unexpected to see some of the uh, consolidation or even the pullback that we've seen in the beginning of this year. I mean, you can go back in time and track market performance after big upswings that we saw like last year. So I would say this, our base case remains unchanged. We're looking for slowing but sustainable economic growth. And we believe re corporate profits will continue to be resilient. And so when we think about interest rates, that's all the rage or all the discussion right now, we actually see long-term interest rates remaining relatively low, albeit they're settling in a higher range. And the way that that informs our portfolio decisions is we continue to actually be underweight. If you think about risk control assets, think like cash, investment grade debt, or even inflation protected securities, we continue to be overweight risk assets. Our highest overweight is mm. in high yield bonds. But we also like develop market equities and natural resources. That is interesting to hear. So, so then when you talk about rates that might be a little bit higher than they currently are now, but are still historically low, what is, I guess, what is the level you're targeting? And given the fact that we have seen risk assets sell off the most aggressively in recent weeks, where have you been buying, if at all, given those pullbacks and corrections? Yeah. So, so if you think about if you sort of, first of all, uh, with respect to rates, uh, if you think about where we are with respect to rates, if we were talking, say, uh, six, uh, nine months ago, we saw rates kind of being in a, in, in a range, um, settling in where the midpoint of that range, call it is somewhere closer to, say, uh, one and a quarter percent. And so we've seen that move up over time. So we certainly accept that that maybe is more kind of in the one and three quarter range over like an intermediate period of time. And so it's not surprising to us, again, where we see rates today. But again, we're looking at that over a longer arc, because we continue to believe when you get in the intermediate and the long term, there are mitigators, like as we get through kind of some of the shorter term supply issues that we're dealing with, that put a bit of a cap on that. We also think some of the Federal Reserve policy for a variety of reasons will be more accommodative, again, over that longer arc of time. And so if you then peek into the portfolio, say, where are we pushing our exposures? We actually like high dividend stocks. Uh, historically, this hasn't been a great environment when you see interest rates rising, but it's different in our estimation this time because of where you see valuations and how you see those stocks performing. We also even like low volatility stocks to balance out some of those risks that you've pointed to in the investment portfolio. Uh, your, your point about um, moderating inflation down the road is interesting because there's been some reporting in the last week on cohorts of traders who are bracing for a policy mistake on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, if, in fact, the numbers come down the way you're suggesting, are you, are you going that far? You think the Fed's going to overdo it? Well, again, so we can't sit here and rule out the fact that there are not uh, some policy uh, issues or there could be uh, an undershoot or an overshoot. The, the practical reality is what the Fed is trying to balance at this point, I think is particularly difficult, right? Because it's not only their historical dual mandate of price stability and maximizing sustainable employment, but think about the thoughts around increasingly balancing these other longer term systemic risks that we talk about. So I, I do think that we have to call out that risk and we're very mindful of it. Again, we still feel comfortable over time that it's something that can be managed. Sandra, we've uh, had John in the past talked a bit about ESG, such an important component overall of investing uh, in the current world. You know, Larry Fink out with his letter this morning, his annual letter to CEOs, rejecting accusations of being, quote, woke. Um, Give me the landscape from your viewpoint right now in terms of the advancement of ESG and whether or not, uh, for example, the proper metrics are, still, are being put in place to really measure the, uh, the progress of, of corporations, for example, from your perspective. Right. Uh, so one of the things is I think it's, it's in some ways unfortunate, uh, the politicization that you get around this in issue. So let me just start with facts. From our perspective, we, we think the incorporation of environmental social and governance criteria affords better risk management. And so again, done well in an investment portfolio, 
we think that you can get better risk-adjusted returns. You, you might think of it from this standpoint. We commonly look at what we would call a financial metrics. And a lot of the, the, the criteria that we look at from an ESG standpoint, in a sense, could be considered pre-financial. But to be very clear, uh, it is empirically relevant, relevant and it's also, uh, it brings with it predictive value. So we fundamentally believe that. Some of the, the discussion is also around stewardship. So how do large asset managers like ourselves actually work uh, with uh, portfolio companies in terms of the uh, influence that we have? And I think there are questions around that, but we ultimately have a fiduciary responsibility to all of our stakeholders. And so we think there is a constructive way to do that in a very responsible way. Mm, it's a really interesting conversation, stakeholder activism, but also monetary activism, which you just touched on in this conversation, too. Shundron, thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. Coming up in the next hour, we're going to talk uh, ongoing tech weakness with Wells Fargo's chairman of Global Investment Banking, uh, Bob Peck, as we see big cap uh, tech pre under pressure, of course, this morning. Dow's down 500, worst day since November 30. Don't go anywhere. Shepard Smith here. Thanks for watching CNBC on YouTube.